Hey there, it's Jen Taub. Today on Booked Up, we have a crossover guest, the incomparable A.M. Holmes. By crossover, I mean she works in all sorts of genres, from fiction to nonfiction to screenplays and even operas. Today, we are talking about her new political satire, The Unfolding, and her best-selling memoir, The Mistress's Daughter, that she wrote in her 30s after her birth mother contacted her. Let's dive in. Hi, Am. Hi, everybody. So, so, um, and from the I'm top. So, <laughs> <laughs> I am so glad to finally meet you. David Handelman has uh, mentioned you over the years, and I realized yeah. we have, besides David, another friend in common, or maybe not, maybe you're not oh, friendly with her, but my friend, um, Jill Greenberg, the photographer, oh, sure. I think yep. you, yeah, I never yeah. read it, but didn't you do an intro for her horses book? Yes, I did. Uh huh. Yeah, I and then she, they I, moved to New York, but I haven't seen her since they came. Oh, well, they're not a they anymore, so okay. they're divorced. Okay. Um, but <laughs> yeah. she just literally this month, I should have been talking about my friend, but <laughs> okay, it's okay. No, she doesn't mind this, because this is like, um, it's no it's no details yeah. where anyone could stalk her. But she's out of New York now, she's renting out her loft mm-hmm. and moving to Rhinebeck. So she can oh, cool. like... cool. Great. Yeah, yeah. Which is so shocking to me. I don't think so. Because there's some good people up there. Oh, I mean, she was just texting me. Who's up there? Yeah, my cousin, my cousin Scott Spencer, who's a writer, and his partner Joanne Beard, and um, uh, Joan Juliet Buck, who's a a writer and editor and art person. There's tons of people up there now. That will Um, mean a lot to her. I mean, she's going to be doing her photography up there. I mean. She's so incredibly talented. I, what was the connection with horses, though? Why did you? I have why no did you idea. write? You're not a horse person. I like a horse, but I'm not like you know. I don't. I don't collect horses. Um, <laughs> I have no idea how that came collect, to be. Remember. Who collects horses? I mean, I don't know if you. Is that the, is um, that the be, verb? Sultans. Sultans collect horses. I've been to horse auctions and seen the really? buying. Oh, yeah. Yeah, was that for work because of the book, or why did no, you go? No, no. Uh, up in Saratoga Springs near Yaddo, the artist colony. Yes. I, you know, I've watched horses training. My kid rides, but not, not you know, at a high level. Did you like um, being at Yaddo? I mean, it seems like it's the, um, you know, the mecca, for, other, that, other that in Iowa, Writers Workshop. What was it like to be there? There are multiple meccas, but they're definitely both of those are, and McDowell, where I haven't yeah. been. Um, I was very involved with Yaddo's board for many years. Uh, and in fact, co-chaired it and stuff. Yeah, it's great. It's a it's a really good place to get some work done. And it's interesting how productive one can be when outside of your own life and really in a community of other people doing the same thing. And also, like, for me, I certainly, I mean, I hadn't met, you know, conductors and composers and so on before I went there. And so that was not Oh, wait a second. It's not just, it's not just writers then. No, it's painters and poets and performance artists and a lot of composers. Leonard Bernstein was there a million years ago. Mm. Aaron Copeland has a big history of composers. Wait, I've got, I'm making notes because this what's, I got, I want to follow up on, on the Aaron Copeland thing in one second, but like, I didn't, I didn't realize that they had, they matched together. It's kind of like my home, like my husband's an artist and has yeah. a studio in the backyard. It really does help um, to be around others that work, you know, sort of project by project and understand the value that procrastination is the only way you actually get stuff yeah. done. That's hard for many people to understand. Yes. My producer probably doesn't realize that my my secret plan in launching this podcast booked up is that I'm actually on a writing deadline. <laughs> For for June fifteenth, I've got to get my manuscript of my next book in. So you know, right. there's that. Yeah, but then you add more <laughs> other things that you have to do because that's when you get it done. Yeah. It's amazing. I've been incredibly productive over the past few months because I, you know, the anxiety around does this suck? Can I really do this? Right. And the agonizing. I'm getting back into the write fast, edit slow which mm-hmm, is a better mm-hmm. mode for me. But this is mm-hmm. about you, not about, about no, me. What, I want to hear the, what, what, is the new you... book, like, what is the new book about? 
shit, you're not allowed to do this. Okay, yeah, uh, the new book. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, do you even know the old books? I mean, have you really prepared for this no, conversation? No, I have not fully prepared, so no. You've got to understand this in the context of the body of work. Um, so my, my first book was uh, called Other People's Houses about the 2008 financial crisis kind mm-hmm. of, it was a narrative linking the savings and loan debacle to the 2008 crisis. It was published by Yale Press. It's actually mm-hmm. a really good book, but I don't think it got as much attention because it requires people to actually read a narrative. And it starts with, I decided to kind of, um, this couple who that called the noblemans, well, let me back up. There was a famous Supreme Court decision from 1993, which is the one that interfere with the ability of people who are underwater on their home mortgages, like they owed more on their mortgage mm-hmm. than the home was worth. They couldn't cram it down. This is something you do in, that's a pejorative expression, but you in any other kind of loan, you can use bankruptcy restructuring to reduce right. the amount of principal you sure. owe to the, right. the, the right, principal to the, the value of the asset. Well, mm-hmm. you can't do that with home mortgages because of this 1993 case called Noble Bin versus United States. So I decided when I met with my editor you know, when I was talking about writing this book, he said it should be a narrative. And I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. And I started to think about, we had this meeting over, over lunch. And I thought, cause it was a new editor. The other guy had left the press and I was freaked out. And this new guy really wanted a narrative. And I did like a scrap my plan. And I was driving home from New Haven up to Northampton thinking about, you know, how, who will be this, who's my people? You know, how, how am I going to talk about, about sure. the 2008 crisis? Where, and I thought, what do I want to have ever happen to the nobleman? So I literally got mm-hmm. home, Am you're not going to believe this. I get home in my house. I pop open my laptop. I'm like, Google, you know, what happened to them? I'm like, oh, well, Leonard died right, you know, uh, right after the case. But what happened to Harriet, his wife? Do you know what happened to Harriet? She lives like around the corner. No, even, even more interesting. She had, what? um, she had just died and her funeral was right when I was having lunch with the editor. Really? Really. So I was what? like, holy shit. So right. then I went from there, you know, instead of actually writing about the 2008 crisis, because mm-hmm. of course, procrastination, I pulled that thread I got from the National Archives, like their bankruptcy. I actually met her daughter in Texas at the mm-hmm. condo that was the subject of the case. Anyway, wow. you don't need to know about this thing, but no, I but recommend that's so the book. interesting. Yeah, I will but read then. The- the yeah. other, but what was interesting is after I dug into this family and what had happened, it turns out they had lost their condo because it was underwater because of the SNL uh, mm-hmm. sort of boom and bust okay. down in Texas. I'm like, well, what about the other party? It wasn't, it wasn't versus United States. I'm sorry. It was, it was a nobleman's versus American Savings Bank. That was mm-hmm. the other party. I'm like, well, who the hell was American Savings Bank? And then I come to find out they were the largest savings and loan to, um, to fail during the crisis. Right. And then I traced them forward. Yeah. And they became, there's this whole, I went backwards to how they blew up. And then mm-hmm. I went forward and they got swallowed up by um, Washington Mutual, who is became the largest thrift to fail during the 2008 sure. crisis. Right. And then, right. but, but, there, but it was, um, but then anyway, there's this whole, you, you just have to, there, it gets, this bank becomes a character in the book. Anyway, I enjoyed I totally writing that. I because I find that fascinating. I really do. Oh, that's I can't me. wait for, I will send you a yeah, copy. But that was the first, like, yes. that was the first book. And the second book yeah. was on um, white collar crime called Big Dirty Money. Mm-hmm. And it, although it doesn't take a narrative approach, it does dig into the history of the term white collar crime about, uh, mm-hmm. about um, Edwin Sutherland. Anyway, I love that book and that, but that one wasn't with Yale Press. It was with Viking. So what mm-hmm. I'm doing now is a second book with Viking. I have an incredible editor there. I had great editors both who's places. Your, who's your editor? Wendy Wolf. Oh, sure. Yeah. She's a legend. Um, I, yeah. I had Bill Fruct at Yale Press, also legendary, yeah. also really good. Yeah. People tell these, these stories like, oh, you know, my editor didn't, didn't do anything. I'm like, what are you, What? You know, know, you want your editor to be in your face and questioning yeah. things, not micromanage. And then, so right, this new yeah. book is on tax. I will stop talking about myself, damn it. Um, but it's called, uh, the working title is Taxation Nation, Lessons from the Loophole Factory. And I'm writing cool. about the history of tax and where we are now. Who knows if the title will stay the same, but I decided to do this one. I'm taking it a step further. I'm kind of going back to the narrative way, but also decided um, I'm doing my own investigative journalism. So I decided to go visit some tax havens. So I went to Cayman. Uh-huh. I don't know if you've been there. Yep. And I went to the uh, to the Channel Islands to this place right. called the uh, Bailiwick of Jersey. Anyway, it goes on and on. So I'm, I'm, supposed to be, yeah. Yeah, I'm supposed to be writing that book. And I also, of course, went to Washington, D.C. and I've met with people there. And I, I have binders of, of, of things to read, articles to read. And right. I have, you know, I have books to read and I have writing right. to do and transcripts to update. 
But instead of just launching right into that, I decided to do a podcast instead. Of course. So that's where we are, I, AM. One last question on this. Are the tax oh, havens shit. interesting places to visit? Unbelievably just, interesting. Do they have the feeling of being a tax haven? Yes, in different ways. Because Jersey also has the feeling of being a place which you may not know was occupied by the Nazis during World mm -hmm. War II. Oh, there's so much. And I actually, because of, you know, this habit of meeting people, I mean, you may collect horses. No, you don't. But I collect okay. people. And right. so between the people I collect, you know, and also I do this thing where I announce to everybody what I'm doing. So then they tell me things. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell people I'm going to Jersey. And then people are like New Jersey. But then someone says, oh, I have right. a friend in Jersey. Sure. And um, then I get to be having cocktails in this, you know, by the by the water and meeting really interesting people who will be in the book. I can't tell you any of the meetings, right. but that's right. how I, so I kind of go about my process in a somewhat linear way and then a somewhat sort of superstitious and it's all about people way. Anyway, mm -hmm. but, but can we just, yes. <laughs> I feel like you could really be my friend in real life. I can. I think this I is can. the beginning of a friendship. Nice. Where are nice. you in New York city? I when am. can we hang out? Whenever I'm here. <laughs> okay, good. So I'm tell me what was I supposed yeah. to be doing here? Oh, tell me about, <laughs> forget the, oh, oh, the Aaron Copeland thing. You wrote an essay yeah. for the Paris Review about how you used to write letters to famous people. And I realized since you just name dropped Aaron Copeland, the, the composer, when I was in elementary school, my, my teacher had us make a book for Aaron Copeland's whatever birthday it was, like it's in the seventies. Right. And I remember that we like made it and then like sewed it together and they, and she apparently you know, presented it to him at something. So that was my first letter That's to a famous person. Cool. Okay, yeah. enough about me, AM, yeah. you. What about you? Okay. What are you working on now? Oh, never mind. I'm not asking you that. You <laughs> threw me off. Okay, I'm going back to talking about your work. Sure. So, so I, what, what I'm having you here, even though this is mostly about nonfiction writers, is that you mm -hmm. are engaged in fiction, nonfiction, and even your fiction has depends upon reality and mm -hmm. uh, you know we were kind of communicating beforehand by email and i think i've come to bit to understand what it is that you're 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 trying to do and i and i mean how would you explain why you situate your characters inside of these really important historical moments well it's interesting i think it's been part of a progression for me so it's say on the one hand looking you know the whole of my career so far, my subject matter is American society and culture, World War II to the present. Um, that sounds like a class I would take. You know, but, you know, I think I am always writing about American society and culture and in some culture and in some ways a little bit with an almost anthropological lens. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm always reading the culture and writing in, you know, not, I don't want to say reaction because it's, it's not reaction. It's, it's in some ways, um, you know, how do we make sense of things? And I would say that the reason that I'm using fiction most often is because I feel like by using fiction, I can also access the psychological and the emotional aspects of American social, political, cultural, economic life in a way that are, it would be difficult to do in nonfiction. So that's the, the short, long answer to that. It feel, it, but, but that's how we live our lives. Like, it, like I was thinking a lot about your um, most recent book, The Unfolding, and I don't want to tell people too much beyond maybe what um, is at, sort of at the beginning, but it takes place in this sort of fictional slash real world um, on the evening of the 2008 election when mm -hmm. um, just before and, 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 and just after Barack Obama is elected and takes us through that inauguration. So that the time frame of the book is then, you, but you wrote it over many years. Um, and it's sort of at the heart of this book, or at least the, well, at the heart of this book is both a family story, be, you mm -hmm. know, the relationship between this, um, a father, a daughter, his wife, what, what's going on with that as they live and breathe their very differing reactions to what this election means. And then the father kind of becoming part of this group that wants to interfere with the um, peaceful transfer of power. Um, so the, this is kind of what, how this, how this story is, is, uh, is told. And it, it just seems to me um, 
that you're using this family um, to kind of do both, talk about the personal and talk about the political at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I think that there there are sort of, you know, a variety of threads in the unfolding, and that's quite purposeful. I wanted to sort of tell the large scale, what we would describe as the great American novel, which is traditionally a very male form. We don't, women mm-hmm. don't write the great American novel. Right. And that piece of the story is definitely about the main character, the father, who's known as the big guy, um, and ultimately the cohort of like-minded men he brings in to reclaim their vision of America because they're upset that Obama has won. And and that ties to a, a, a something that I feel like is true to our history, which is that what seemed like a moment of great hope and, and progress to many of us also seemed to trip off a barely latent but powerful uh, thread of racism and mm-hmm. sexism in this country that's still blossoming fully today. Uh, and so part of it is I'm literally looking at 2008 as a lens of how we got to where we are now. And then definitely in the family, I also wanted to look at sort of a multi-generational story of women's lives mm-hmm. and kind of different kinds of awakenings. Um, a daughter, Megan, voting for the first time in 2008, who begins to realize perhaps she doesn't see the world in the same way as her parents or as, a, as she was raised. And the mother, Charlotte, kind of realizing that she has not yet lived her own life, that she was focused on being a wife and mother and her identity has been sort of, you know, overtaken by that. So how does she mm-hmm. to claim some space for herself, um, which is, I would say, the sort of the more intimate and domestic story within. And then the big guy who is this space occupying person <laughs> who doesn't realize what it means to be a space occupying person and how, how, crippling that is to those around him and and his own kind of coming to consciousness as he realizes that he might be a little bit of a jerk and he might not be quite the good guy that he thinks himself to be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I do like um, that the characters seem so real, but they are emblematic. I mean, by Mm -hmm. having a character called the big guy, you you stand in for patriarchy or or stand in for anyone, as you're saying, that can take up all that space. I've been thinking so much about... um, some of the metaphors in the book, because as we talk about your um, talk about this idea of the domestic and then the also sort of larger narrative, um, I think about two things. Um, one on the plane when um, when Megan is sitting next to a journalist and she he mm-hmm. says, oh, you, she's over she's eavesdropping on a conversation. And he asks her, did you get that down? And she explains to him that she is journaling. She keeps a journal, whereas he says, you know, he's a journalist. And then I thought about the other that sort of mirrored with when her mother, Charlotte, quotes Joan Didion Mm -hmm. and um, talks about, you know, the kinds of people who keep journals. And as I was thinking about this, it just dawned on me that you are that what you're doing, the project is journalism and journaling. And I don't know if you realize that those sat next to each other that way. No, I had no idea, but you're totally correct. <laughs> yeah. And that and that in the best of ways, that's the beauty of, of writing, right? Because there are things mm. that, that one does and things that, you know, a reader realizes and, and makes note of that make perfect sense that are not overtly conscious, but that 100% are accurate. Yeah. Yeah, no, I find that... Um well, you're doing, yes, if you step back as a reader of yeah. your own work, if you can get enough distance. Yeah. The other thing I noticed, and this I'm sure was not intentional, but the the food that the uh, that the that the daughter uh, Megan liked to eat was a tomato sandwich sprinkled with sea salt. And I thought, is that a reference to Harriet the Spy with her notebooks? Oh, interesting. Or- <laughs> I, I don't know. Does Harriet okay, the Spy shoot. eat tomato sandwiches? <gasps> The, did you read Harriet the Spy and then the sequel, The Long Secret, or no? You never read those books? I, I remember Harriet the Spy the littlest bit, but not well. Oh, It yes, wasn't a big book for me. I know it was for many people. Yes, I was a constant journal keeper and, you know, eavesdropper and note taker. And uh-huh. that's why I was thinking. Um, the, the thing about the great American novel, yeah. which you said, is usually that title is given to big books by men. And we can mm-hmm. think of different ones yeah. over the years. And 
I wonder if, um, if, I mean, I know you use a, a, a name that doesn't have a gender associated with it, but, but you haven't decided to be someone like George Eliot to completely have, well, in that case, George Eliot has had a, a, you know, a male name. She chose Mm -hmm. that. But, you know, do you think that in the world we live today, that anyone who's wrecking, who is identified as not being male, will what critics will ever say something they produced is the great American novel has, has any book by a woman ever been given that? um, I think that's a, that's a good question. And that's a good way of phrasing it. Um, I don't know if it's ever happened. I think that um, both the publishing and reviewing and, you know, sale and consumption of fiction in this country is very gendered in a way that it's not outside of this country. Um, Including that, you know, often it has been said that men don't read books by women. And I don't know that that happens in Europe or in in other places. Uh, And then a male writer asked me, and it was a very good question, why women didn't write the great American novel. And I said, well, you know, historically, women were not necessarily in the workforce, uh, you know, even at the turn of, you know, the beginning of the 20th century. If they were, they were at low level jobs and had to leave when they got married or God forbid, if they got pregnant Um, And so they didn't have access to the great American experience. They also didn't have access Mm. to the economy, you know, not until like the late 1970s could a divorced woman get credit, could buy a car, could have a credit card. You know, a woman's credit was tied to her husband. Right. Um, So financially, too, women were not part of the great American experience. And I think that piece of it is something that on a, on a sort of academic and economic and cultural level, I don't feel like anyone's particularly written about or talked about. Um, but it explains to me why women were left in the kitchen writing. You know? huh. um, but since we're, if we yeah. had to, since we're just using this, this label, yeah. um, who would you, who, what novels, I mean, I have a few in mind, but I'm curious which ones you would think right. over the years have been considered or novelists have been considered in that category. And would you say Dreiser or? I mean, Theodore Dreiser is a, a, a man, right? So I know, no, not women. I'm saying men, no. just because I'm curious. What are those books? Because that we would say. Yeah. So absolutely, yes. Um, I'm trying to think in terms of, I mean, there there are many, but they're not by women. You know, uh, I think right. all of the Jonathans in the recent years are considered, you know, among the great American novelists. Um, you know, there's not that many Davids, but there are a few. Uh, it is interesting, but I, I think, you know, uh, it, it is a, a, it's a misnomer because I also think, you know, outside of the U.S., they don't say, what is the great British novel? Uh, you know, Hilary Mantel was certainly considered a great contemporary British novelist and her books were both historical and of enormous kind of scope and scale and so on. Um, mm. You know. Yeah, maybe it's just a weird way of trying to be in the in sort of an America, you know, there's there's this um there's this expression in academia about publishing within um the the right academic journals and the, you know, when you're on the job market and people say, you know, they uh they can count but they can't read or something and there's that mm-hmm. way that maybe it's all about like what is the best? What wins the award right. as opposed to what do you enjoy? What speaks right. to you? What are the what are the books? I mean, I, I always find it weird if someone says, what's your favorite book? I haven't had a favorite book since I was in eighth grade. Right, it was exactly. yeah. To Kill a Mockingbird then, and it became right. the sort of litmus test for whether I could be someone's friend. I remember literally right. asking that before I would ha- continue the conversation. Right. Now, but if someone asks question, me... But it was a better question to ask them, which Barbie do you like, right? There's that other... I mean, there were other friends who would be like... Yeah. You know, so... I wanted Barbies, but my mother wouldn't let me have them. Me too. And my mother wouldn't let me have them. That's so interesting. I finally got my friends to give them to me for my birthday. I got one when I finally... <laughs> which one did you get? <laughs> I don't know which one it was, but I was like, look, mom, I got to go over to Susie's house. And if I go without a Barbie, I'm in, in big trouble and it's not going to work. 
It which um, haunted me my whole life because I used to work when I was a corporate lawyer in the GM building. I think they may mm-hmm. call it something else now. Um, that's where my law firm was. And that's where FAO Schwartz used to be. And in the 90s, I don't know if you remember, but if you go in the back door of that building off of, I guess, what's the one after Fifth? Like, is that Park Madison? next street? Madison. So Madison. if you go on the Madison, yeah. Madison Avenue that. entrance, yeah. and then there's a glass window and there was this giant sort of funnel, this just a cylinder filled with water and tiny little Barbie shoes that would go from the ground and bubble to the top. And I, every morning I would have to stare at that as I walked in. Yeah. Well, I famously wrote a story <laughs> about a boy dating a Barbie doll. You know, in, what? In, yeah. I wrote a very famous story called A Real Doll about a boy who's dating his sister's Barbie. And it was interesting because a lot of magazines wanted to publish it, including like Playboy and so on. And their lawyers advised them not to, citing the case of Debbie Does Dallas versus the Dallas Cowboy <sighs> Cheerleaders, because Mattel uh-huh. was famously litigious about Barbie. And there was an open question to is whether Barbie was a public figure and could be written about. And, you know, Todd Haynes made a movie that had Barbie in it and so on was, and went to court. And then ultimately, as Barbie grew up and kind of came of age, all the writers and artists who'd grown up playing with or not being allowed to play with Barbie (laughs) made work about it. And ultimately, I would say that the threat of the case went away. And Barbie, I would say, has become a public figure, which is interesting. You know, I think when I was a child, I didn't understand what any objection could be. And now I'm just, there's so much, there's so much. So where where did you grow up as a kid? Like, where did you run around? Were you in a city or? (laughs) I grew up in Chevy Chase, Maryland in the very strange uh, edge of Washington, D.C., surrounded by, uh, my family were basically socialists, so it was not the right place for socialists to grow up. And, you know, we couldn't have grapes because they weren't union, and we couldn't have lettuce because it wasn't union. And and all around us were kids who had, like, diplomatic immunity and so on, and our bikes would get (laughs) stolen. And the police couldn't get them back because they weren't able to go into their driveways. And it was just a wacky, wacky place to grow up. That is so absurd. And did you always, was there a point in your life when you started, you remember starting to write? And what did that, what was that about? Well, like, how did you, what kind of writing were you doing? Or wasn't it always, and let me just back up and say, uh, I think, you know, I I think that um, you've written essays. I think the essay that I was referencing about writing to famous people, people, you reference having a great deal of anxiety. I mean, obviously, if you listen to me, I have clearly have a lot of anxiety. I wouldn't have the energy to do the stuff I do, right? That's where it goes. Um, but I wonder if that was related to your writing when you were young and how, how that happened. Oh, anxiety? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think more importantly, I, uh, I'll show you. Here is okay. my first book. <laughs> what is that? It is my first it's book. It's beautiful. <gasps> your first book. The stories of Haunted Homes Hollow. Um, what yeah. age? And it looks like you have bubble letters for the half title I, there. It was in the early, it was like 1972. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, it's dedicated to my right hand. No, so I actually really had learning issues. So I was quite dyslexic and quite impaired. And so school was not easy for me, nor was writing. And so it's interesting because nobody thought that I would be a writer, but they meant like, like you won't write a check, you won't write like your homework, you won't do anything, much less be a writer writer. There was no yeah. understanding at that point that creativity or intellectual power were you know, separated from the ability to form accurate letters with a pen. And so it was a pretty, I would say, a pretty nightmarish um, time. Mm. And so yeah. I don't I think my anxiety. I mean, like, I, there are so many things one could talk about, but but school stuff was hard. And so writing for me didn't become a thing that I thought I could do on any level um, until some point in high school. And then actually I, I wrote a bunch of, like, papers. I liked history a lot, funny enough. Um, yeah, that doesn't surprise me, right? <laughs> exactly, about the history of the CIA and all kinds of other, you know, wild. Wait, 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 wait. In high school, you wrote about the history of the CIA, yeah. right? When you were, yeah. is it because of where you were located that made you interested oh. or what? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And because lots of people around me, you're like, what does your dad do? And they're like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, so there, there, was a lot, there was a lot happening. And Washington <laughs> in, the, in the 60s and 70s was pretty wild. Um. So, I mean, yeah, you were there I mean, in the Nixon. You were writing that book I in was. the Nixon era. Totally. Yeah. Um, 
And that I would say Nixon's, you know, Watergate and all of that was the dovetail, I think, for me of my kind of coming of age morally and intellectually and watching, you know, those hearings were the first hearings that were broadcast. And it was riveting and disturbing. And it was also in that period that I didn't occur to me that Washington kind of ran the whole country. I was at summer camp at a, as a Jewish kid raised in that Washington area. Somehow my parents sent me to a Christian camp in, in North Carolina in the deep South. And that's where I was when Nixon resigned. And I remember people were crying and I was thinking, oh, there's got to be a party happening. Yeah. And so that was a moment where I was like, wow, so wait, Washington affects the whole thing. And, you know, yeah. when you grow up there, you don't realize that. And then it's a little worrisome because you see how Washington works and doesn't work. And you're like, wait, this rinky dink southern town, you know, runs this country. Um, <laughs> and, you know, all these people's dads with their weird jobs and their weird habits are like deciding what's going to happen next. So I think that was on <laughs> one level very inspiring because you meant you could anything could happen. You know? And just going back to the writing, so you write this paper about the CIA, and it yeah. was through, so it was in history, like research papers in history class that made you decide you enjoyed writing. Is it the writing that you enjoy, or no. the discovery, or the, no. like, which part? I, I don't know. I think I like, I like information. I like learning about things. Mm. I'm very curious. Um, I like the ways in which, it, all the more even recently, that, that we are discovering more that history is really histories. There are many histories yes. within a history. Um, and it's all storytelling. So it's all to me like incredibly rich, fascinating stuff. And then I, you know, a little later I got interested in art history. Um, and that was fascinating too, to realize the ways in which actually art, literature, music tell the history of a time period. Um, and in some ways are different, if not better, uh, witnesses than documentation of the time period, right? Than, you know, hard fact. Yeah, I, I just, I'm just thinking a lot about the work you produce and your process and how different the, so when you're doing um, yeah. historically real fiction, obviously mm -hmm. you're getting to research things, getting facts accurate, um, yeah. doing that but that's very, and of course, communicating those pieces, but that's a very different process than really looking and watching people and hearing the way they speak and the kinds of details mm -hmm. um, and behavioral details that come up um, when you're writing fiction that allows for you know us to hear interior monologues. And I wonder... Do you have like a, like some sort of separation between the two sides of your brain, and then or do like do you do one long. piece at one time, one the other? Because this is not this right. is not usual. I mean, you may say you right. have dyslexia, and that's neurodivergent, right. but what you do here is not it's not the usual. So right. how does that work? I will say one of the ways that it works is it takes a long time. So yeah. that's a piece of it. And yes, it's absolutely a ton of research and a ton of studying. And then ultimately I'm creating characters. So the characters, uh, the question is always, once I sort of begin to create a character, is what is organic or true for this person? And in order to oh. know that, I need to know, how did they come to this moment? Why are they in this moment? What preceded them here? How do they see the world? I think a lot, weirdly, about people's economic lives, because I think a person's economic status changes how they live, changes their experience of the world. Obviously a family, you know, like this family, if they were all living in a one bedroom apartment would be a very different experience than having multiple homes across the country and, you know, uh, not at all having to think about their financial lives in terms of what they can afford. Um, that's huge. And, and that's one of those things when one either writes or studies fiction, no one ever talks about, no one talks about the economic life of the characters. But I need to know that, that. always I mean, annoys me. I don't know a I single know. person who well, doesn't, once they're over the age of 10, doesn't think constantly about economic lives. Yeah. And including kids actually think about it a lot. Yes. Mom, can I have this? Can I have that? Yeah, totally. It's always yes or no based on can we afford it, no matter yes. how much money you have. Right. And so that interests me a lot. But also, you know, given what I then sort of pull together in terms of this portrait of a person, 
it has to be both organic to them and accurate for them, which are sort of the same. Um, and so it has to be like, well, what, how does this person see the world? How do they think about the world? What are their relationships like? How do other people see them? Um, and in those ways, I would say my, if not training, my uh, awareness comes a lot from playwriting. Uh, mm. And that's very, I think, on display in this book because there's mm-hmm. a lot of dialogue and not a lot of sort of direction between things. And from reading playwrights like Harold Pinter, Carol Churchill, the English playwright, Edward Albee. And what all of those playwrights do is they talk about things without having to name the thing they're talking about. Yes, yes. And to me, that's also what we are all doing when we're having conversations about our lives. And that is very different than, um, in some ways, than reporting or than journalism in the most classic sense. Because it is being a witness to the ways in some ways that they're avoiding the conversations. Um, So true. And in journalism, I mean, and I'm being general here, reporting, if we just call it reporting, we know the order of information. You Mm -hmm. you start with the like most important thing, even if you have a hook, and then you sort of get, right. And to me, you show your playwriting skills as well as your incredible storytelling skills by the decisions you make about pieces of information that you reveal. And I would just say, um, I uh, I guess it's so toward the beginning that it doesn't really reveal much, but we have um, the big guy at the very Mm -hmm. beginning at a bar having drinks with somebody who we come to find out has been in a pool, right? Right. right, Swimming. And then much later, we find out who he's gone swimming with, which is somewhat relevant. But it's this moment where it allows the reader to go, oh, then why didn't he say, and there are lots of, there's just, and I appreciate that. Whereas with a, a, you know, not that all journalism or all nonfiction is just strictly let's follow things in chronological mm-hmm. order. A good writer won't, won't do that. Mm-hmm. But um, there's so much, so much of that showing and not telling that you do right. by what people don't tell each other, yeah. um, what they don't say. Um, it's really... Uh, it's yeah. just, it's, it's extraordinary. But the um, fun of that and the beauty of that is also trying to build a world with enough clues and enough information where the writer can also trust the reader to put it all together. Because, yes. you know, and, and I will say, readers are very sophisticated. And mm-hmm. especially in some ways, too, now that everyone has watched so much TV on top of all else. Oh, right. That the ways in which narratively one used to have to kind of lay things out like the you know the carriage wheels rolled down the path to whatever you can now cut to that you know you could like yes. Jane Eyre you know on speed it would be like you know ah. pulled up to the house you know the carriage pulled up to the house you don't have to like give the long preludes to things in the same way in fact you can't I remember I've, I've been talking to who was I speaking yeah. with someone a friend of mine who writes for middle middle readers is that, is that what they're called? Totally, yeah. and she uh, she's just like you can't kids won't read the books we read. You can't give someone Harriet the Spy. It's right. too slow. It's right. too slow right. for kids. Kind of like right. you try to watch an, an old movie and they're just like, when is it going to cut this frame? Right. You know, it's right. just a different. It's just people. And you're right. People can follow multiple threads. They can see the sort of proverbial MacGuffin that's mm-hmm. whatever red herring right. that's been dropped somewhere, and they're waiting for these yes. clues. Um, yes. Yeah. So that is true. Yeah. Um, you know. So I, I want to ask about um, writing, writing the mistress's daughter, mm-hmm. writing a memoir in your thirties, mm-hmm. um, and. I, I would never like I can't I sometimes put myself in my work, but yeah, I just don't know the courage it takes to do that and whether you felt better after having done it. <laughs> so funny. I, no, everyone <laughs> everyone always asks that. <laughs> uh and the answer is absolutely not. No, everyone always thinks when you write a memoir you're gonna feel better afterwards. Absolutely not. Um, oh god. I think I think that for me part of it was the desire to capture the information and the experience of being found by my biological parents, you know, when I was in my 30s, and also the awareness that if I didn't capture that information and kind of put it in a container of some sort, it would change over time because we change over time and and the rest of one's life and history unfolds. And so I wanted to be sure to kind of 
get that. And then in part two, I felt there were, there were times I thought, God, I really don't want to finish this. You know, it's very hard and, and painful. But I also thought in, in, in multiple ways that I was bringing to it my skills as a writer that I had developed, you know, doing lots of other things. And that was a plus because I think finding language for what I would describe as primitive emotional experience yes. is very difficult. Um, and I found it difficult, but I also felt that it would have relevance to other people who were struggling with that. And I think in that, I feel good about that part of it. Um, and I f- feel like I did a good job, but I would not describe the experience of writing um, memoir or autobiographically as pleasant at all. Um, I think I think I asked I did the yeah. weird lawyerly thing um, yeah. where you ask them a question you know the answer to because you mm-hmm. also described it as a feeling of having vomited which mm-hmm. is not a great feeling at all no. yeah so but you have no choice kind of it's the way that describes right. I would it say exactly unlike yeah it's not like it's you know I think people always think it's going to be cathartic and it's also interesting because we live at a time when people there is a lot of kind of navel gazing and a lot of like confessional, you know, I was a drunk and now I'm not a drunk and here's what happened. Um, I've never been particularly drawn to that kind of writing. Um, and I do think even now, like there's some other stuff I'm interested that, uh, in writing about that is autobiographical. And I think for me, it's mostly about demystifying things. Mm-hmm. Um and, and like at some point I might write about having learning disabilities, being a terrible student, being somebody who nobody thought would have success of any kind. Um, because I think for others who have those struggles, that can be useful information. Like I'm always talking to my students about that, which is funny because I teach at Princeton and they are not, you know, particularly disabled students. Um, although sometimes I have some, but I want them to know that, you know, we, and we also live in a moment where people look at somebody's, whether it's your social media or your outward self, and they go, that person is successful. And whatever that road is to that is not necessarily as simple as people think. And I want to acknowledge struggle. I think it's really important. And I think that it's not necessarily a bad thing either. Everyone's like, oh, you know, I should be ashamed if I'm struggling. I should be this if I'm struggling. I'm like, struggle is struggle, and everybody struggles at some point in some way. Uh, And by the way, boring be the person who never struggled. I mean, how weird would that be, right? Yeah, I mean, I I can't even, I can't imagine what that would be like. I I think that if you have any empathy, then you would see struggling all around you then, and that would be like the boundary between your happiness and someone else's, I would hope isn't that... uh, you know, I hope it's more porous than all that. Right. Um, yeah. But your mother, your I should say, you have two mothers, but um, your birth I mother. I only have one mother. Oh, you only right. have I one. I really have the mother who raised me. The mother who raised you. In your book, happened. in your book, you, you act, you, yes. But the, the woman who gave birth to you yes. came, went to find you. Yes. And um, almost became childlike, <laughs> needed to be parented yeah. in this way that, I mean, it was just overwhelming. I mean, I could, yeah. I, you can really relate to your situation. And yet at the same time, um, you, I think you did good by her. What I, I think that I don't, I, I think I'm also super, was super curious about where things landed with your father. Are you the, the, the guy who impregnated her? I don't know how to say this because he really biological wasn't a father parent. to you. Yeah. Your biological parents, these biological yeah. parents. But yeah. the person who I just absolutely adored in your book was your grandmother. Yeah. And he, obviously your love for her came through. Yeah. Um, do you think she was the most important parent parental figure in your life? Actually, I shouldn't say, again, I'm doing that American yeah. thing. Yeah. What was, she, it seems like she contributed in a really meaningful way. Yeah, absolutely. She contributed in a really meaningful <laughs> way. I would say, you know, in, in some ways, and, and as a parent, I think I, I have a, a, a different experience. It's not too. I think she was somebody who the relationship was not complicated, right? The relationship, oh, you know, okay. you have, because if you have adoptive parents and biological parents and they have needs of their own, and my adoptive family had had a child who passed away and 
There was a lot of grief in the family and so on. My relationship with my adoptive grandmother was much less complicated than that. Um, Mm -hmm. And she was a very interesting, powerful woman in her own way. She was somebody who had been raised on a dairy farm in Massachusetts. And ultimately, sequentially, she came down to Washington, D.C. to work like during the First World War, you know, in in the government. And then sequentially brought, you know, all of her nine brothers and sisters and parents to Washington, so moved the family there and, and moved them really from a rural farming life into, you know, urban business and all that stuff. And, you know, later in life, she was part of, she had a, an investment club and she was one of the women who started the first bank in this country by women for women in the 1970s. Um, Has anyone written about her? Not, no, there were articles a little bit about the bank years ago, uh-huh. but she, and, and she ran a business, a, a wine importing business, you know, with my grandfather, with her husband. And she was really like in a way out there and really like an advocate for women's abilities to do things. And I, so that, in that sense, she was powerful. Did and you say know, where she was born? I, did you she tell was me that? Or? born in North Adams, Massachusetts. Oh, right around me. Near the hairpin turn. Yes, absolutely. I live in Northampton. Okay, yeah, <laughs> right. So they totally used to, uh, they, they, she, and, well, not she, but her brothers used to sell, ga- sell gas and also water on the hairpin turn because I guess a lot of cars would overheat. Um, and they were always, yes, the Mohawk Trail, that was where they. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow, wow. Yep. And, but yep. bef- so, so she was born in the U.S. Were her parents, like, where, do you, where, do, where does the family come from before that? came her parents came from Latvia, uh, and uh-huh. she was born in 1900 in the U.S. Wow. And she was also wow. somebody who had eye problems and didn't know there were stars in the sky till she was 15 and got glasses. <gasps> That's incredible. I know. And, and your, um, there was something that I had read about your biological father's ancestry that sounded mm-hmm. kind of unbelievable. Yes. Well, on the other side, and it's interesting because (laughs) I I think, you know, when I think about that part of things, I do think of myself as being of and from all of these people. And in that way, Mm -hmm. I think of myself as being both very American and very layered. So my biological father's family is interesting because his father was a Jewish man from New York who married a woman whose family had landed on the eastern shore of Maryland in the 1500s on one of the first ships oh that God. came from England. Um, mm. And we were, you know, property owners in Maryland um, so long ago that at one point the family owned the land that Capitol Hill is. So they owned really all of Capitol Hill. Oh my Hill. God. <laughs> and I would say sold it in like 1550 or something crazy like that. Um, well, that was a mistake. <laughs> exactly. Oops. Jesus. Um, but it is interesting <laughs> to think about, you know, how all of those experiences play out on people. And I think, you know, when I look at, we're talking a little bit about the big guy and what does that mean? I think when somebody's history goes back that far and they know those threads are there, there is a kind of entitlement and there is a kind Mm -hmm. of big guy swagger and space occupying that when you see somebody just doing it, you think, where does that come from? And then you see other people who are immigrants or who may have come more recently who feel unentitled or not able to ask for or claim or, you know, get what they want and need. So all of that interests me, you know, always enormously. Mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to think there's so many different, different sides to your, to your family. Oh, but we don't need to do that. Um, what are you, so you work in so many different genres, um, fiction, nonfiction, playwriting, even screenwriting. Yep. What is, where's your, um, what do you do that for, for just what kind of mindless uh, fun do you do that's unrelated to, to reading and learning and writing? 
Well, that's a good question. I would say I love art. Um, I, I, I secretly collect a little tiny bit of art, but I love looking at pictures. I love, um, you know, I love traveling. I love looking at places, but I, I, I comfort myself by wherever I go, you know, a book tour or anything. The first place I go is a museum or a library because those are sort of my safe spaces and that's where I find myself. Um, I love listening to music, you know, from all, all time periods and so on. I find that is a big piece of unlocking my brain. I've been recently writing operas. I've written two. Oh, really? Yep. Is that through a connection with David? Because David's other friend um, no. wrote, a, wrote the libretto from, I have a friend who's a composer and um, Lena, uh, Luna Pearl Wolf. Yeah. If you know her, she's a, no. she's a good friend and not David, David, um, what's that? one of David Handelman's friends wrote a libretto for one of her opera. She just wrote an opera about Madoff. And, right. and also the Queen of Hawaii. Anyway, so what did you well, work tell on? Tell her opera I for? want to write an opera for her. I really am into it. Um, you would like her so much. I, I can that. absolutely connect you. I owe her a phone call, but yeah. Do that. That would be fun. Um, yeah, I really, really enjoy that because what to me also, because opera has music and language and visual mm-hmm. and acting, and it really feels to me like you can do so many things in it, and there's so many different elements and ways to tell a story. Um, and so I'm very, very interested in that. I'm actually going to be teaching a class this spring, an experiments in opera class at Princeton with a composer. Uh, and that'll be fun. What opera, what opera did you work on? I did an opera for the Kennedy Center, a short opera for the 50th anniversary that opened there this spring. And then I did a full length opera that had six composers for this company experiments in opera a couple of years ago that turned out exponentially better than I ever would have thought and was really cool. Um, and it's been, it's funny, my grandmother, the one we were speaking about, used to listen to the opera all the time. Mm. And she was the kind of person who liked to get her hair done on the weekends. She would get like, I don't know, what we would say, like a blow. <laughs> Every Friday? Uh, my Saturday. mother used to get her hair set. Oh, her hair yeah, set on Saturday. It was like they okay. would get their hair set. Remember, they would have to yes. sit under the dryer. Those little like totally. yeah, dryers. So I would usually on Saturdays, <laughs> I would be driving around, I don't know, with my grandmother most of the day, and she'd be listening to the Metropolitan Opera broadcast in her Bonneville. Well, you know, and that was just part of my childhood and the opera quiz and all of that stuff. And that, to me, that's like the best stuff because that is the stuff that just sinks in in the same way that my dad used to go to museums all the time. And that was mm-hmm. what we did. You know, we weren't, they weren't like, Let's go, you know, play catch or do whatever. It was very, very sort of intellectual and kind of serious. And these inadvertent educations that have really, I would say, sustained me in many ways. What are you thinking about doing or what have you started to do with your own child to carry some of those traditions forward while also recognizing that this is their own person? It's difficult because Mm. it's not as easy as it used to be to make your child do something. Uh, I, mean, I don't know how to say that more than that. Or maybe I'm not as good at it. <laughs> no, I think but, that describes. <laughs> right? Right. No comment. Yeah. No so, comment. You, you know, yeah. one hopes that some of it rubs off. And I will say a, a couple months ago, she was home from college and said something like, let's go to the Metropolitan Museum. And I was like, you know, okay, you know, Absolutely. And then quickly, you know, renewed my membership that I'd let lapse because no one would ah. um, But I think, I, you know, one hopes a little bit. Um, and she got a little bit into music. She was really not into, you know, sort of other than contemporary music when she was singing in a choir. And all of a sudden, it was interesting because she, she wrote her college essay about discovering her Jewishness by singing Christian music at school. Um, and so that like was like Leonard Burns, like who, what kind of uh, like uh, who, what kind of Chris, Chris, what kind of music written well, by Jews? Uh, or written? You know, everything from, I guess, a lot of the choral music that was uh-huh. taught at her school, mm. you know, had, had Christian roots. And then whenever there Beautiful. was a story that was had any Jewish, whenever the choral director would be like, and this story is for you to sing. <laughs> you know, oh, gosh. Um, I have to. That reminds me. I've got to tell you this. This is uh, what family yeah. legend. So I, I love Christmas music and I was mm-hmm. in a singing group and, and, and really I think we do, I think we may be saying part of Handel's Messiah. I mean, mm-hmm. I love, I love this, but, uh, similarly my, my older brother is two years older. Um, 
it, it, when he was in his, it was a boys girl, boys school and a girls school kind of together. And at his the boys school, his, his guy in charge of the sort of choir wanted to, uh, I guess my brother was complaining to him and the other Jewish kids, like, you know, how come there are no songs for Hanukkah? Mm-hmm. So he said, well, why do we always sing that stupid Hanukkah, or Hanukkah, come light the menorah, whatever, or right. dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. And, the, and they said, well, Mr. Bellinger or whatever said, is there another song? And so my brother said, yes, there's a song we sing in our family. And the lyrics were, Ani rotzeach lechalet lebeit hashemush. Do you know what that means in Hebrew? Oh, what is the translation? I have to go to the bathroom. That's really and so, <laughs> so my brother okay. put that to the tune of a, of some Jewish, you know, God, some like so dreidel, funny. dreidel, dreidel, what the heck? Right. And he had all the kids singing it until like this one kid, I don't know who it was. I'll have to ask my brother if he listens to this. We'll see if he's listening. Adam, yeah. you, you come tell me. But one of the kids ratted him out. Like, why are we singing? I have to go to the bathroom. And so he funny. got in so much trouble. Yeah, he was like that. It was great having an older brother like that. What school was that? <laughs> so I'm from Michigan. Yeah. It's Cranbrook. It's now, oh, it's now oh. Cranbrook. I went to Kingswood and it has a, that graduate art school. Are, yes, are you familiar absolutely. with it? Or? Yes, of course. Yeah. Well, so my kid went to school not far from Northampton up in uh, at Northfield Mount Hermon. Yes, of oh, course. Which of is course. so much fun. Yeah, she had a really good time. But was she there during COVID? Part of it, yeah. Oof. yeah. Yeah, I have a kid who just graduated from college and I have one in, in high school now. Um, and so it's been, that's all been an interesting thing. Yeah. Um, well, so we need to, I mean, this is like the beginning of a beautiful friendship, I think. <laughs> yes, um, I, so. I mean, although that movie doesn't really hold up in the way that, that one Which had movie? hoped it would. That's from Casablanca. Oh, right. The very it's, end. See? Sorry, spoiler. Spoiler. No, totally. I <laughs> Jeanette rings a bell. Yes. You know, it's so funny, though, but, you know, these lo- these when you watch these old movies about love and you, when you're young, you're like, oh, how could he leave Ingrid Bergman with the high key lighting? And she's so gorgeous. Right. And now I'm older. I'm like, yeah, that would have gotten old. <laughs> <laughs> it's better just to have the guy friend and hang out That's really funny. in the fog. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I've changed. Totally. Yes, I've changed. Um, anyways, is there something that we didn't I should have asked you about that I didn't? No, I don't, I don't. Or you don't, should have asked me about or something. I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, there's so many things one could ask about. Well, how do you know David since he's been such an important feature in our friendship, our, well, our young friendship? That is a good question. I want to <laughs> say, I feel like I knew David a tiny bit long, long, long ago. Um, and then got to know him a little bit more through Writers Guild stuff and various oh, great right. things. Um, and then through his, his and Sid's love of theater, which they go to so much more oh, right. than I do. And uh, she's a playwright too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I'll have to have Sid on next. I mean, anyone David knows, right? Just have the whole. He knows a lot of people. He knows good he, people. He does. Yeah. He does. He does. Well, I'm it's not that been good such of, a I, pleasure. I, I, yeah, I wish I was a better people collector. I'm I'm a little introverted for people collecting, but I Oh, I but aspire. just you only need to know a couple people collectors and I can, you know, I'm one collect one, people you for know. you, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. You name a topic, I'll tell you I can connect you with somebody. Fantastic. Well, look at that. We and when what can I do for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, would you be on my podcast? It's called Booked Up. Yeah, yeah, I would love to. I would I've heard it's wonderful. So we haven't I hate oh, to tell you, we haven't been taping people. This is just the pre-interview AM. So now we have to go do this all over again. I hope you remember everything we yeah, spoke totally. about since you've, yeah. is that okay? Yeah, totally. <laughs> okay, great. Well, next time I'm in New York, I yes, will tell please. David we have to get together. That would be so much fun. I would love that. Me too. Absolutely. Have and a great thing, I have to rest. With the, oh, I have yeah. to leave you with the Northampton thing. So speaking yeah. of playwrights, here's one last thing I'll tell you. So a million yeah. years ago, and I want to say it was like, Maybe 19, I don't know, 93 or something when uh, my book in a country of mothers was coming out and I mm-hmm. came up to Northampton to give a reading and, you know, the bookstore would send like a young person to pick you up and drive you in circles yeah. to kill time. And I had just started thinking, I want to buy a house somewhere. <gasps> and we pat, we're driving around. And I said, oh my God, that's exactly the house I want to buy. It was a white house with a front porch and a swing and a red front door. And she goes, that's wild. That's where Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf was. Yes. Found. And I know I which said, house it is. It's right on the Smith campus. Yep. So I said to Edward Albee, you know, not that long after that, I said, Edward, the weird. Wait, wait, thing. shut, wait, wait, <laughs> shut the fuck up. You, you can, you what? can just throw out that sentence I yeah. said to Edward Albee. So I said, so okay, to continue. Edward, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I knew Edward because I had been a guest at his uh, artist residency several times. 
And, you know, I'm adopted and Edward is adopted and Edward was from Washington, D.C. So we used to talk about these things. And I said to Edward, Edward, this is the weirdest thing. But I was, you know, being driven around Northampton and, and I pointed to this house and I go, that's exactly the house I want. And he thought that was the funniest thing ever. And I have to say, it is so weird that yes. in terms of sensibility, the one random house a person would point yes. to in America is the house where Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf was filmed. And that is so I, my sensibility and my heart, which is uh, wild. I just, I, I just have to take this moment because if I had ever met Edward Albee, it would be like the first 30 seconds of my talking to another writer, not like right before we're about to wrap up. And secondly, yeah. I love him. I love the line from a zoo story where he says, you have to go back, go long distance to come back the right way correctly. I knew that that was sort of my life's path that I was off track. Also, um, I obviously love Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. What a dump. And and I saw Three Tall Women when it mm-hmm. came out. And it was incredible. Did you see the the, he, the newer iteration of it or the original? The original. When it came right. yeah, yeah. yeah, with um, what's her name? Um, who were the three women? Um, I, I, I'm trying to remember, but it was the original cast because I yeah. it must have been in the 90s when I was living yeah, in New York. Absolutely. Yep. It's interesting because I remember seeing it then and then they redid it a couple years ago and it was so interesting to see the redo of it. It was fascinating. Did you like the redo? Yeah, I or did. No? I actually did. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But I've got to get back into theater in New York. It's Me just too. been, you know, with well, kids, I just... That because I so have to go. I haven't been like okay. anything and I feel like, you know, lame and out of it. Although I did see Leopold Stat, which I recommend. Okay. Well, we'll just make a list. I I'm, I will only watch a musical if it's really good. I mostly Same. like Same. I don't really like a musical. I'm like, okay. I don't come here yes. to sing along. I come here to be traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, exactly. thank you. I, I thank came here you. to be traumatized too. So that's okay. good. <laughs> We're to come. All right. Bye. That was such a great conversation. This literally was the first time I have ever seen or spoken to A.M. Holmes. I have read her work and some book reviews about her. And of course, my friend David Handelman, who we kept mentioning, has recommended her to me um, over the years. And so this was so wonderful. I'll keep you guys updated if we ever um, meet in person and go see some plays. Maybe I should even have her back um, in a little bit to talk um, talk about what we saw and what she's working on next. And be sure to tune in for the next Booked Up with Jen Taub and follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.